Magnus pulled out a cloth as he tried to calm his panic. He began to clean the blood off Ileana. She groaned in pain, and he soothed her. It would be okay. Her injury hadn't seemed fatal, and the bleeding had already stopped. But as she lay unconscious, the way she'd hit her head earlier concerned him and she'd fallen twice at that. She might have suffered from a head injury, but he couldn't be sure. Parto spoke up from behind him. How fortunate, Lady Glane was faster than she looked. Magnus agreed as black tendrils whipped up around him. His anger couldn't be calmed. But it was an unfortunate case for Perto. Because now you'll die by my hand, he said as his eyes took on a menacing glint. Perto scoffed in disbelief as he watched a gigantic black beast appear at Magnus' side. Ileana slowly opened her eyes and she found herself laid out on the ground, a coat that must have been Magnus, underneath her head as a pillow. As she slowly sat up, she winced as pain throbbed in her shoulder. She looked at her shoulder questioningly as she noticed the large blood stain, and recalled that she'd almost lost her life had she been a few inches more to the left. She stopped and a thought crossed her mind. Had she died? Maybe the spear hadn't actually missed her. But a loud screech of a bird drew her attention and that was where she noticed Magnus stood as per toe and his wind spirit, defended themselves against a huge black beast. Pertow's bird grabbed him by the shoulders and took to the sky out of the beast's reach. But Magnus had already anticipated this and as he flicked his hand, long vines came down over Pertow and his bird. The vines grabbed Pertow around the legs and arms and slammed him into the ground. Pertow lay netted in the black vines, trapped. Pertow complained as Magnus walked to him, but he told Pertow not to whine like a child since he'd not unleashed his true power yet. In fact, he struggled to restrain himself from killing him right there. Because the true punishment for attempting to take the life of his empress was beheading. Magnus sighed in regret, he should have just taken his life when she'd convinced him to do otherwise. Perto sat up, still trapped in the vines, as he concluded that Magnus had just confirmed his suspicions. He was indeed under the control of Ileana Glane. But he was more curious as to how Magnus had managed to acquire a contract with the Spirit of Darkness. How had Magnus brought it under his control? But Magnus glared at him since it seemed like talking to him reasonably wasn't an option. Ileana watched as they faced off. Had Magnus really tried to behead the captain of the Storm Knights? But he couldn't because Perto and the Storm Knights would be a great asset to him in the future, since they represented the authority of the Emperor. Magnus raised his sword to chop off his head but Ileana stopped him as she shouted out his name. He froze as he heard her voice and turned, looking once again like the innocent Magnus she'd known. She looked at him calmly and told him that her shoulder hurt. How much longer did they have to stay here for? She held her hand out as she told him she'd like to go back to her room. He walked to her and kneeled as he apologized for making her wait. Your wish is my command, he told her. He grasped her bloody hand, brought it to his lips and kissed it as he softly called her, My Lina. He pulled her abruptly into his arms, the action startled her. She might reopen her wound if she moved too much so he would carry her inside. He walked away from the scene that looked as if a great battle had been fought, with Perto sitting in the dirt as the black vines disappeared. Back in the room, Magnus tended to her wound as he wrapped her shoulder tightly. She sighed, exhausted with the day's events. Magnus guided her down and pulled the covers over, gentle the entire time. She laid back with her usual expressionless mask, but inside she whined at what a traumatic experience she'd had. She was hit with a spear for the first time in both her lives, and it had terrified her. She hesitantly asked why Magnus had been the person to treat her wounds, and not Cheryl. He sat beside her and told her that he'd had experience patching up such wounds and it was too late to bother Cheryl, but if she felt uncomfortable, he'd have Cheryl treat her tomorrow morning. She softly called his name and her tone drew his attention as she thanked him. Everything about this moment seemed to surprise him and a look of bewilderment crossed his face. He leaned over and kissed her brow before cuddling into the crook of her neck. He apologized for his carelessness, something that would never happen again, he vowed. As she lay there long into the night with Magnus in her arms, she thought about everything that had happened. From being trapped in the dream for days to the near-death experience she'd gone through. 
Rather than being suspicious of his gentle actions and sweet words, she was relieved she still breathed. She hugged him, accepting the comfort she sought after a long time. Ileana thought about Magnus' behavior after the incident. When the truth is right in front of you, you won't believe it unless it fits to your ideal. Unless it doesn't destroy your carefully built castle. It's easier to believe a sweet lie than it is to believe the harsh truth. His words, his actions, his sweet expressions, and gentle touch. She knew all of it was part of his elaborate plan for his revenge, yet she couldn't deny this attraction she felt for him, this attraction that she so desperately wanted to believe was not her own. Only then could she move forward. She blinked drowsy, as she slowly woke up. Magnus noticed she'd awoken and told her it's almost noon. She'd slept for a long time. He pulled out a glass and poured water for her as he told her it's almost time for lunch. She was to eat and take her medicine after since she still had a slight fever. Three days had passed since she'd almost lost her life and in that time, Magnus never once left her side. He'd worryingly hovered each time she got treated much to Cheryl's annoyance. As she sipped on her water, she glanced at him and then asked if he'd be with her today as well. But no, because he had duties he needed to attend to this afternoon. He sat down and looked at her much like he'd done these past few days, with that soft, gentle expression. Please rest Lina, he said sweetly, and she almost thanked him but froze before she could utter the words. Instead, she asked for a favor. She wanted to go on a walk since she'd been feeling stiff, and she'd been stuck in bed for a while. She went on to convince him, but he interrupted her. He would allow it since Cheryl said some exercise would be good for her, but only for an hour and no more, and a guard would be accompanying her and her maids. She readily agreed, excited to finally go out and thanked him. The maids and a guard walked a couple of steps behind her as she strolled along the flower beds. She picked one from the garden and brought it to her nose, enjoying its scent. She asked the maids if there was a flower more fragrant than the flower she'd picked, and one maid suggested searching on the other side of the garden. As they escorted her, she thought about how dangerous the situation she was in. Magnus might be protecting her, but she knew it wasn't out of love. It was out of his desire to enact the absolute revenge on her. The maid pointed at a shrub, holding many hydrangeas. They told her that this flower was aromatic and had a calming effect. If she scattered a few petals in the bath, it would help her relax her mind and body. Could she pick some of these she'd wanted to know? But the guard offered to do the task for her. As he broke the flowers of its stems, he froze as a face hidden amongst the flowers was revealed. He stopped and looked closely, surely, he'd seen wrong but as he realized it was indeed a human, he let out a loud scream. But it was a little boy, and he shushed the guard to be quiet because he might get caught. But the guard could care less about that as he questioned the little boy. Who was he and why was he playing in the imperial garden used by the medical division? The boy told him to be quiet once more, but it was too late as another boy popped out from behind him and he shouted triumphantly, Found you. Ileana and the maids huddled close to the guard as they watched the children and their antics but she paused as she realized the little blonde boy was the same boy she'd visited when she'd slept, and the boy too had recognized her. After their meeting, Ileana sat with the little boys as they munched away on the snacks the maids had brought for tea time. The dark-haired boy introduced himself as Cassio and explained they'd been playing hide and seek. He went on to introduce the blonde-haired boy, but the boy slapped his hands over Cassio's mouth, silencing him. His name was a secret and he intended to keep it that way, he explained slyly. Ileana smiled as she accepted his answer. She thought about how strange it was to meet this boy outside of a dream but why did he want to keep his name a secret? And why were they playing in the imperial garden? The blonde boy stated rather insolently that while they'd enjoyed the snacks, they would be leaving now because they were busy, but Cassio wanted to know if Ileana could play with them as well and the blonde boy grinned delighted at the idea as he invited Ileana to play with them. Ileana pondered over this idea. It sounded much more fun than just walking around the garden, but the guard suddenly leaned over her shoulder as he told her how dangerous that could be. But how dangerous could it be to play with children? He randomly told her how his heart had almost stopped beating when he discovered the little boy in the flower bushes. 
she told him while that may be the case, they were merely children, so they were hardly dangerous. The blonde boy shouted out his idea to build a sandcastle happily and a place near the rose garden was perfect for this, but the guard was shocked the little boy would suggest the empress to be, play in dirt. He nagged Ileana loudly, not to play with someone as dirty as those little boys and his voice startled her. It seemed Magnus had picked a good guard she thought as he persisted with his unrelenting grumbling. Ileana sighed tiredly as she gazed at her finished work. She'd built a castle in the sand, and a spectacular one at that. The boys exclaimed loudly how amazingly real the castle looked and they weren't the only ones. The guards and the maids stood, mouth gaped in shock at their lady's talent. They applauded her on her work as they praised how wonderful she was to create such work from just sand. Ileana sat there as she soaked up their words of flattery like a sponge, glad that her major in her previous life gave her such skills in this life. The boys wanted her to make something else, and as they considered what to make, a voice shouted out Cassio's name. He turned and smiled brightly as he called out Big Sister. It was Cheryl, and as she scolded him for running off without telling her, she'd pinched his cheeks in punishment. But he told her he'd been playing with Raphael. Ileana watched them. Did Cheryl have a younger brother in the original novel? She couldn't recall such a detail. A thought crossed her mind about how many minor details the novel failed to mention. A rustling sound caught Ileana's attention and she turned around just as Magnus came into view. I only allowed a walk in the garden and that didn't include playing in the dirt with children, he said with a commanding tone. Ileana looked on in confusion and she called out his name softly. As Magnus gazed at her with disapproval, she wondered why he seemed so angry and explained timidly that she met them while out on her walk, not looking him in his eyes. As she slowly looked up, she told him that while she disobeyed his orders it wasn't like she wandered out of the garden but paused at the look on his face. He grabbed her hand having heard enough, intending to take her back to her room but stopped short as suddenly the little boy clung to her waist. Ileana looked at the boy in confusion, only just realizing what happened as the boy loudly shouted accusations flung at Magnus for bullying Ileana. She startled in utter terror at what the boy said and left Magnus' side in a hurry and ran to the boy, as she shouted at the boy to apologize, afraid of Magnus' reaction. Magnus let out an abrupt laugh at her tone as memories of how she treated him exactly the same rushed forward. He grabbed Ileana by the hand as he said with a derisive smile on his face, You really are amazing, so this child is your new beast. But the beast taming another beast is absurd. You have an unbreakable chain around your neck and I'm the one holding it now, so everything you do requires permission from me, but to achieve that I realized I would have to stop you from breathing first. And with that he whisked Ileana away to the room reserved for her in the palace. Ileana fell to the floor with a thud and looked up at Magnus. He looked at her with an empty expression, void of any emotion and told her that this was her prison and nothing more as he stepped closer. His face suddenly lit up with wicked delight as he exclaimed in a low, frightening tone, I think the darkness you gave me is actually what you fear most, and pulled out a satin sash. Ileana realized what was about to happen and closed her eyes in defeat. A thought crossed her mind as Magnus tied the silky material over her eyes, I thought our relationship had changed from how kindly he treated me but it seems I had false hopes, saddened once again at his cruel behavior. She felt his gloved fingers graze her lips and flinched but did nothing else, and with that he stated the rules she was to follow with a low commanding tone. Ileana was not allowed to utter a sound from now on, nor was she allowed to remove the blindfold. He then explained the consequences of disobeying, how easily he could rip out her vocal cords, cut off her arms and permanently paralyze her legs if he wanted. When she answered it was but with a soft defeated lilt of her voice. Yes, Mag. He smiled pleased at her obedience. He finally had her in his grasp, under his control. He left her on the bed, once again in darkness as he reminded her of his words. She knew she should have expected Magnus to behave this way since this was his original role. Everyone was devoted to their roles. Except for her. She'd found herself pathetic as her heart beat erratically. She lay on the bed, her hands fisted tightly. Why was she feeling this way? She was scared. 
Ileana Glane was cut off from the outside world and Magnus had abandoned her in darkness. A woman who would rather break her neck than bow it down in submission, finally bowed her head and trembled for him. She could only sleep when he was near and only spoke when he willed it so. He finally had her in the same position he'd once been in. It was the revenge he'd longed for but why didn't it satisfy him as he'd anticipated? Even when things were falling into place like chess pieces on a board, it never felt satisfying. Magnus was startled out of his thoughts as someone called out his name. He sat at the table, surrounded by ministers, as they mentioned matters for his approval. One minister mentioned the approval for mass production of weaponry. A special bomb using mana stones with high steel cutting force. A weapon that would likely never have a rival, Magnus commented. And the minister grew hopeful that his proposal would be granted approval, but Magnus didn't feel the same as he said, that while it would be a powerful weapon, mass production seemed highly unlikely since it required four mana stones, and in addition to that, ten people would be required to just smelt that type of sword which would be a waste of labor. It would be more efficient to use regular bombs and train knights in more advanced swordsmanship. Magnus would be open to reviewing the proposal once he developed a shortened production process. The man glanced away nervously as he accepted Magnus' words, noting how Magnus never missed even the smallest details. As they finished off the meeting, a sudden commotion outside the room drew everyone's attention. Magnus lightly spoke about how he'd missed many meetings but suddenly showed up today as Marquis Glane walked in. But Marquis Glane hadn't time for useless chatter as he got straight to the point. He requested an audience with his daughter before Magnus officially announced her as Empress. But Magnus ignored his words as he told the Marquis that he hadn't given him permission to speak about this matter. Marquis Glane insisted that Ileana would be taking on the title of Marquis and if he dared to ignore Ileana's wishes and proceed forward, His Majesty should expect retaliation from House Glane. Every single house backing His Majesty was important for his support as Emperor. But what if His Majesty were to lose all his supporting pillars? The Marquis said in his usual stoic tone, but the threat was clear in his words. Magnus understood the implication and spoke in a quiet voice, but the power behind it couldn't be mistaken. What was so undesirable about becoming the maternal relatives of the imperial family, Magnus questioned. But Marquis Glane was not afraid as he said that the support of the imperial family should be given to a house in need of it. Why was His Majesty so fixated on a daughter from an insignificant Marquis house? Please give my daughter back, Marquis Glane said but Magnus immediately refused, and this only served to infuriate the Marquis as he shouted out angrily. The guards lunged forward blocking the Marquis's way as his voice rose, and Magnus told him he'd patiently listened even when he'd threatened the Emperor's position but perhaps, he wanted to lose his head just to pass on his title to the lady. Because his actions implied that was his plan, but Magnus would not allow it to come to fruition so he would ignore the Marquis's outburst this one time. As he walked to the door, he told the Marquis to leave but the Marquis only sighed, and his next words stopped Magnus in his tracks. Ileana has lost her memories from before the Coton Institute, and he couldn't ignore his daughter who didn't even have her full memory. But Magnus couldn't hear anything else as he recalled his own memories and the Ileana he remembered. The woman who tamed him as a beast and the woman who insisted he was a human and not a beast. Of course, he'd noticed the stark contrast in her behavior. He walked through the hallway, one destination in mind. She'd lost all her memories of taming him. Is that why she treated him as a human? He burst into her room in a fury and stomped towards her. He grabbed her by her shoulders and she fell back onto the bed. He asked her as he covered her with his body, Tell me something Lina, have you lost all your memories? He grasped and interlocked their hands as he told her the Marquis had informed him. She'd lost her memories in Coton, but that wasn't right. He knew she'd lost them before that. It was the day she'd given him the antidote. He smiled as he pulled the lacy blindfold off, and she gazed at him wide-eyed. His smiled almost gleefully as he looked at her and his words stamped certainty into their past, her actions making more sense now as he spoke. He recalled that it was that day she'd stopped calling him a beast and at that moment she'd seemed like a completely different person. 